Good evening, everybody. I'm glad that you can join us this August 15th. We have a great uh, meeting uh, planned for you this evening. Uh, I have a, just a few uh, announcements for my chapter, the Dusty Baker Sacramento Sabre chapter, before I pass it over to Marlene, who will facilitate the discussion with Melissa. Um, I uh, am uh, excited, just got back from Sabre 52, like many of you, um, and was uh, very uh, excited. The Dusty Baker Sacramento Sabre chapter was named one of the all-star uh, chapters amongst uh, Sabre. Uh, so that was a, a great honor uh, that we were able to accomplish based upon our performance uh, over the last year. Um, a few upcoming uh, events for our chapter. This Saturday, August 17th, we have our annual event at Little Fenway West, which is a 25% replica field, wiffle ball field of Fenway Park. Uh, one of our members uh, has offered his uh, uh, private property uh, for, to host the event. He also has a small baseball memorabilia museum. We will have Dan Taylor, uh, who authored Baseball at the Abyss uh, about uh, mid-1920s baseball and the controversies uh, surrounding uh, Ty Cobb and and how kind of Babe Ruth in 1927, Murderers Row Yankees, kind of helped uh, get baseball over that uh, hump. Um, so if you are interested in that, please uh, let me know no later than tomorrow morning, just so we could account for you with food and everything like that. Um, also, we have, um, or at least it's not ours, but uh, one of our uh, friends of the chapter, John Lena Dacus, has a film screening of both Lefty O'Doul and Being Ty Cobb on Saturday the 21st or 24th at 1 p.m. in San Francisco at San Francisco's main library. Um, that would be great if you're able to attend. Um, our co-chair or our vice chair, uh, Tony Oliver, is coordinating a carpool to the Yellow High Wheelers game Sunday the 25th at 1 p.m. And this won't just be any Pioneer League game. Our uh, friend, our long-term friend of the chapter, Perry Barber, uh, who many of you are familiar with, is going to be one of the umpires for the game. So uh, that should be an exciting afternoon. Um, and uh, last, before I pass it over to Marlene, um, I do have some tickets for the Giants game Friday, August 30th, 7.15, that uh, I would be happy to pass along to any interested uh, member, just at my cost of $10 per ticket, uh, if you're interested, please let me know. Um, I did send last, actually, let me add one more thing. I did send out an uh, email uh, recently of just about me stepping down at the end of the year. Um, I was pleased that there have been a few people who have expressed interest in kind of having a chair by committee. Uh, so it looks like we'll be able to retain uh, the chapter um, and events into the next year, which I am excited about. Um, and. Uh, speaking of what I am excited about this evening, we're very happy to have uh, Melissa joining us, um, and I'm going to have you uh, introduce her, Marlene, and talk to you a little bit about uh, anything that's going on in your chapter before you facilitate the discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Zach. Thanks, Melissa, for being with us. Um, um, our lefties co-chair, Steve Treader, is with us tonight, too. Um, he's also just recently returned from Sabre. I don't know if there's anything you might want to mention. I want to remind people that the 7th Annual Women in Baseball Conference, sponsored by Sabre and the IWBC, is upcoming on September 20th through 20, 22nd. That is a virtual conference to accommodate our international um, audience. Uh, registration just opened today. It's on the Sabre site. Um, I'll be sending out uh, information about that. I'm sure it'll come out in this week in Sabre as well. Um, so hope you can join us at that upcoming event. It's actually, I think, that's right after our next uh, Thursday, third Thursday Sabre meeting too. So we'll have lots of baseball to enjoy over the rest of the summer. Um, I am delighted that Melissa is able to join us tonight. I, she probably needs no introduction to you all. You know, she's a very well-known, a national journalist, and her, I think her, some of her biggest impact obviously has come through sports journalism. Um, she's uh, well-written. Um, we're going to talk tonight about um, 
locker room talk, um, which is about the uh, court case against Bowie Kuhn and Major League Baseball to allow her access to uh, the clubhouse. It's a great read. Um, I hope uh, if you don't have the book yet, I hope you can get it. Um, so Melissa is going to chat for a while. And then we're going to have time for Q&A. You can put your questions in the chat or, you know, after Melissa is finished, um, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just visit and chat for a while. So Melissa, it's all yours. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you for having me. I was just saying before uh, we sort of uh, found all of us being gathered together, I was saying to Zach and Marlene that having just been at my second uh, Sabre conference, having missed a year, um, I just was commenting on how welcoming Sabre is for people and how much I always kind of feel at home the moment I arrive there. And um, I'm starting to get that feeling tonight. So um, thank you all. And um, let me do a share the screen and bring up a little uh, little visual um, accompaniment to my words that I'll have. I'll try to get through this in maybe 20 minutes or so. And then Marlene, maybe you can facilitate uh, Q&A. You may have some questions of your own. And then we can certainly open it up and, and spend some time on those. But let me try to give just an overview for people of, of my book and sort of where my thinking is now on it. So let's see if I can make this work. Uh, let's go here and share. Okay, I think that we're getting close. Play from the start. Okay. This is kind of how I felt at Sabre to, at Sabre uh, 2024. Uh, obviously, it was Sabre 52 in terms of the 52nd convention. But there was a new light bulb that went off in my head uh, <laughs> when I had this experience. And I want to show you where I was uh, when I began to have it and why. I was sitting at this table that was created for uh, me and for displays for uh, women's baseball chapter of Sabre. And they were so wonderful to sort of highlight my book signing there and draw people's attention to it. So I took my seat at that table and um, people obviously commented on the women's baseball chapter and their center. And then we went into discussions about my book, which um, I had ordered 60 of them to uh, see if there was that much interest. And I'm really happy to say that they all sold out plus the two I had brought in my own bag I threw into the hopper, and those went too. So here, well, I want to go back. So with every person who came to the table and bought a book, and uh, I was going to sign it to them, I didn't want to just sign my name. I didn't want to just write something that was just kind of a, maybe bordered on being a cliche, maybe wasn't something that really resonated with the person who had just you know, wanted to invest in learning about my story. So my uh, dedication to my book starts with the dedication to my mother who passed on the love of the game to me. And then to my daughter to whom I was able to pass on my love of the game to her. And so I asked this question and that light bulb that you see is really comes from the answers that I began to receive from people in the conversations that we had. I'm just gonna share a few of them now. This is a daughter on the right who came to the table and her mom, as I later learned, was standing off to the side. I didn't see her right away, but immediate, immediately Luca, who began, I began to talk and I said, who was it who taught you or, or passed on the love? She said, my mom, my mom, she loved the game. And then she kind of pulled her mom over and gave her a big hug. And pretty soon I wanted in on that hug too. So we got up and took this picture. But, um, you know, I will will remember them for a long while because they were there at the Sabre convention together and it was clearly, you know, baseball that was uh, their love affair. So it was fabulous. Um, then came another man who came to the table and I asked him the same question. And he paused for a long, long time before he started to talk back and give me his story. I was kind of waiting and it began with the words, my blind grandmother. This is not a picture of his blind grandmother. It's meant to be evocative. 
but he told me how when he was very, very young, his his grandmother, who had gone blind, would get up every afternoon and walk into the living room where she'd sit in her rocking chair. She'd work her way to her rocking chair, and then she'd turn on the radio, which was always set to the Milwaukee Brewers. And she would play the Milwaukee Brewers as she's rocked in her chair. And after a little while of conversation, he said that to me, and I said, you know, she, I said, I remember when I was in my own grandmother's house, and that's my two grandmothers. The one on the left is the one that uh, loved baseball so much and lived in, in Boston, my mother's mother, and how I would sit on the floor. And he said, oh, that's how I did it too. I'd sit on the floor next to her rocking chair and she'd rock back and forth and she'd be talking about the game and she'd be telling me about baseball and getting very excited. So I remember him. Then Brian appeared and Brian immediately started telling me about his wife and then about his daughter. And I had a sense that Brian was already someone who was drawn to baseball, but he, clearly his wife, Nicole, who I hadn't met at that point, I later met, got a chance to meet her. Nicole was clearly a huge influence on that family in terms of love of baseball. And then later on, he brought his incredible daughter, Bailey, to come over and see me. But while Brian had been describing Bailey and, and speaking with great pride of her, he pointed over across the room to some of the posters in the exhibit. And he pointed to this one that was at sort of the end of the poster line. And I said, your daughter did that one? That's the one I was standing at, trying to read everything. I thought it was terrific. I was having a long discussion with some guy about it and all of this. So, you know, it was just an astonishing conversation. So later on, I went over to hear Bailey do her presentation. Bailey is in high school. She's in high school. And she did what I think is an extraordinary poster. The research was, it was incredibly difficult to get. I thought that it was one of those posters where all of her evidence just stood out so well. And as she was, I took this picture when she was surrounded by a bunch of people, probably two times or three times her age, you know, and you know how people are at Sabre. They really want to dig in. And I'm sure they were peppering her with all sorts of questions. And I kind of walked away and I ran into Brian and Nicole. And I said, well, Bailey's over there trying to kind of hold her hold her way against this swarm of people asking all the questions. And Brian just looked at me and said, she'll handle it. And I just thought that's fabulous. So um, these are the kind of stories that I was hearing. A few more pictures from this um, from the time at Saber of, of people I met. Um, up in the top is Tracy Gear, Gear who's a, a journalist at the Star Tribune. Of course, you all know Cat Williams, uh, who is doing so much to work on the uh, Women in Baseball Museum in Rockford. Allison Levin, who was there, also did a fabulous poster, did a presentation. And then, perhaps close to my heart, was this young woman who called herself Red. And I think any of you who, who know me at all probably also know that my daughter is adopted from China. She was adopted during the one child policy. And as Red began, began to talk about her life in China and how she'd come to Ohio State to study and she'd fallen in love with baseball and she wants to go into either coaching or umpiring, um, it was just fabulous. And I have somewhat become a little bit of a mentor to her and connected her with a woman I know in Cambridge and they might get together. So it was truly wonderful to kind of develop these friendships through the book. Billie Jean King, who's hovering over me in that photograph, she did not come to save her. However, that's a cut off, a cut out of her. We went to a bar of their own, meaning we, about 25 women from Saber, took off after uh, my book signing and we all went over for the afternoon to a bar of their own, which is only the second only uh, women's sports bar in this country, uh, in Minneapolis. The first one was in Portland, Oregon, and we had a great time. So this made me once again, reconsider this phrase and this part of this essay called Fathers Playing Catch with Sons. 
that was written uh, six years after my lawsuit was filed, in which it's clearly, clearly in the mind of Donald Hall, who, by the way, is one of my favorite poets, a wonderful, wonderful man, a resident of New Hampshire. And, you know, he writes very evocatively of it, but there's no presence of women in this. There's no presence of the grandmother or the mother or the daughter or the aunt. And so in sense, that light bulb that you saw at the beginning was me not feeling very, any longer very alone in all of this. I knew that I was a little bit odd during the 50s and 60s for loving baseball so much as a girl. But now that I've had the experiences I've had and in writing this book, um, I understand that, you know, baseball is a sport that many, many, many women treasure, love, and have great stories to tell. And many sons of women have learned the game of baseball from their mothers. Let's look back over time. We move from 1948 with, of course, Maybelle Blair. This is not her in 1948, but more recently throwing out a pitch at the uh, Mets game. And this is uh, Jillian, who was the first girl to start a California Intercollegiate Federation baseball championship game in 2022. So it gives you the scope of, you know, kind of where we've come uh, in these years. Um, and it brings me to the notion of you have to see her in order to be her. And so here we have Mary Garber from 1950, who was a sports writer in North Carolina, won lots of awards in North Carolina. I recently, or not recently, but I was given the honor of a Mary Garber Pioneer Award named after her by the Association of Women in Sports Media. And I think my point with the thing above is that now within our culture, we've even gotten Barbie to put out sports reporter dolls as well as women as umpire dolls. So here we have from Barbie to Perry Barber, and we have this uh, game in which all women umpiring crew. So again, I want to emphasize here, um, See Her, Be Her is a new documentary on girls and women in baseball that has uh, been made by Gene Firth and Jeff Idelson. I noticed that Gene Firth is going to be the keynote speaker at the Women in Baseball Conference, which is fabulous. This is uh, going to be shown on the MLB Network between games two and three of the uh, World Series this year. So again, we're starting to see much more, um, you know, kind of bringing forward what's always been, I think, a part of women um, and girls, this desire to compete, this desire to play and seeing how it's realized. This is another way to realize and to show our story, which is at the National Baseball Hall of Fame, the Diamond Dreams, where my story has become part of a larger history that includes the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, as well as a number of people who have broadcast uh, the games through the, uh, through the decades. Then we have the first uh, evidence of a, a woman being inducted into the Hall of Fame, my great, great friend, Claire Smith, uh, who was inducted into the writer's part of the Hall of Fame. And uh, she invited me to come that weekend. And as you can see, I shared that weekend with my daughter. And there's my daughter and myself at Fenway Park when she was four. So it's, again, that generational handing down of this love of baseball. This is going to be another way to remember that history when the uh, International Women's Baseball Center Museum in Rockford, Illinois finally opens and we can all go there and we can see this history come alive. So I'm eager for that to happen and encouraging people to donate to make it happen. All right, so let's go back. My story is about baseball in the 1970s America. And I say 1970s America, why do I say that? Because my story isn't something that happened in a vacuum. It was about a time in our history. It was a time when women were marching in the street. It was when women were going to court to fight the discriminatory laws that didn't give them an equal starting line at most any place they wanted to kind of start in a career, um, it, getting a credit card. You couldn't get a credit card without your husband signing for it. 
So, um, you know, these were very different times. And so my suit, my lawsuit is not, again, happening in a vacuum. It's happening at this time in our history. And um, I'm going to walk you through it very quickly and leave time for questions. I think we can get perhaps much more in the questions than I'm going to be able to give you. But this will give you a sense of the culture at the time and the way that people uh, responded to my desire to do my job, because that's how I frame it. All I wanted was to do the job that I was lucky enough to have, which at the age of 26 was to be a baseball reporter for the largest sports magazine in the world. I loved it. How lucky could you be? Particularly if you were someone who loved baseball as I did. And the idea that I couldn't do that job fully, that people were saying, no, you can't. And the only reason is because I'm a woman. It just didn't seem right. And again, in the spirit of those days, when a lot of walls were falling, um, evidently it was time for these to fall too. So you see here, um, you know, we were kept out of the locker room. Um, these cartoons basically express what the uh, sentiment was by the men in baseball. In Kaminsky Park, where I was in the fall of 1976, and this is to give you a little view of what things were like just a year before I was seen as challenging the commissioner on access to the clubhouse. I had just gone into the press box in Kaminsky Park, where I don't think they'd ever had a woman, or if they had it, it had been a very rare, rare occurrence. I had gone there to report a story with Roger Kahn, who'd written The Boys of Summer. And this is from Roger Kahn's book, where he describes what happened. He didn't share any of this with me in 1976, but I had to read about it in his book, October's Men. So I'm in the press box, and... Um, and Roger is sitting down next to Vec, and as he writes, some old line baseball writers variously stared and oogled at me. One writer came up and, and said intensely into my ear, your girlfriend doesn't belong here. You know that. What do you think this is? Ladies night at the Turkish bath. So this is in 1976. It's a bit of a scene setter. Later that same night, we were supposed to meet up with Bill Veck and spend a couple of hours in the Bard's room uh, with Roger and he talking and drinking their whiskeys. And I was going to be drinking my seltzer water and taking notes. That's what I was doing. That's my job. So Roger and I got there um, before the other writers did. And at that point, as the sports writers started coming in, he writes that they glared at Melissa and then at me. And though I knew some of them, no one offered a nod or even a friendly look. It was as though I had brought a harlot into the temple. After a bit, the bartender motioned me aside and he whispered, sir, your secretary will have to drink in the hall. This is Roger. I snapped. She's not my secretary. She's a reporter. And if she has to drink in the hall, I'll drink there too. So all I remembered about that night, he never shared again what the bartender had said, is that we were suddenly got leaving the Bard's room and we weren't got, we're not going to see Bill Vec that night. We did end up staying in the, in the Bard's room the next night after Roger called Bill and said, you're going to change the rules and you're going to change them now. And he did. I spent most of my time in New York because as a reporter at Sports Illustrated, I was based there. And during the 77 season, there was no more interesting team than the Yankees, arguably. You had Reggie Jackson. You had the tempestuous Billy Martin. You had George Steinbrenner as the owner. You had Thurman Munson. You had a soap opera going on in the uh, clubhouse, but you also had a team that was winning on the field. So it was quite a combination. And so I was probably at Yankee Stadium more than any other place that year. And by the middle of the season, Mickey Morabito, who you can see over Billy's shoulder, was the PR person. And it was pretty important that he was roughly my age because he got it. He understood what I was talking about when I would share my frustrations at not being able to interview the players, how I would ask, you know, uh, the other writers to go into the locker room and see if a player would come out and meet me in the dugout so I could talk to him, you know, et cetera, before the game and players would often not show up. And Mickey, by the middle of the season, came up with a plan. And his plan was 
that he would go in the entrance to the uh, clubhouse or the locker room. He would then come around through this passageway. I would meet him at this door and he would bring me into Billy Martin's office. So this is what the locker room looked like. And for anyone who hasn't been in a major league clubhouse, the toilets, the shower areas, areas to change for the players, they're all in the separated. No reporters are allowed there. So this whole notion that I was going into this space and invading what would be the what Bowie Kuhn liked to call the sexual privacy of the players was a ridiculous notion because the players could make any decision they wanted to about how they would come out of the shower into the living room. I mean, into the locker room. And besides that, I was also kept out of the locker room in the time between when batting practice happened and when the teams took the field for the game. That was an incredibly valuable, very calm locker room, 45 minutes of time. And that was the most valuable time of all for a magazine reporter who wasn't reporting game by game. And I was also excluded from that. There was not one player who was naked. Not one player even had his shirt off. They came in from batting practice with their uniforms on and they went back out with the same uniforms on. I was not allowed in there. So this was really never a case of nudity. It was a case of wanting to exclude women and keep this an all boys environment. So that's Billy Martin in his office. That's a little look at the old clubhouse in old Yankee Stadium. And you will see up here in the corner, stamped October 1st, is a daily clubhouse admission pass with my name on it. Mickey left that for me the last two games of the season. I met him on the field after I found the clubhouse admission pass waiting for me. And I said, Mickey, did you really mean to do that? He said, absolutely. He said, you've had every opportunity to sneak out from Billy's office and try to go in the locker room. You haven't done any of that. You're fine. I trust you totally. Use the pass how you want and it's yours. And so for the last two games of the season in 1977, they gave me that pass and I just used it in the time before the game. I wasn't reporting on the game, so I didn't need to be there afterwards. And being the gradualist that I was, I thought better to just uh, have them get used to me than have this all of a sudden start to happen and have some kind of reaction that I didn't want to deal with. So during the American League Championships, I also was in the clubhouse with the Yankees. So by then, time we get to the World Series and I've got this pass given to me, I know that the Yankees are okay with me being there. It's the Dodgers that are coming to town. The Dodgers have no woman reporter who's ever covered them. And so given the fact that I have a pass that says I can go into the clubhouse, given the fact that the Yankees have been okay with this, I went to the Dodgers and placed what I would call a courtesy call. And I first went to Tommy Lasorda, who I'd met with Roger Kahn in 1976. He knew me well. And when I mentioned the idea of just asking for access to him after the games in his office, he basically didn't know how to respond and he didn't respond. He just walked away. And he said, you talk to Tommy John. He's the player rep. He'll deal with you. And uh, he just wanted nothing to do with this discussion at all. Tommy John, on the other hand, was terrific. He, we walked out to the dugout. This was during the game before the World Series started. We walked out to the dugout, and um, and when we got to the dugout, Tommy asked me all about, um, you know, what happened with the Yankees and the rest, and he said he'd have a team meeting. He'd talk about it with the players, and he'd get back to me before the next game. It turns out that it was the Dodgers' vote saying that it was okay with them for me to go into the locker room that caused Bowie Kuhn to say during the middle of that game that it didn't matter if the players had given me permission or either team. As far as he was concerned, he was the only one who could do it and permission was never granted. So I'm going to skip ahead here just to mention a few things and then we can get into it. Marlene, I think, can facilitate some questions, but I want to certainly leave time for those. When we finally made the decision after trying to negotiate with the commissioner through the fall, it was clear that in his mind, separate would always be equal. 
he could separate the women, he could separate me, not allow me into the clubhouse, and he would contend that I would have equal access to the ball players because uh, someone would run in and bring a ball player out to me. Well, that was not equal access at all, and it's not how a reporter does their job in a locker room. So when we went to the Southern District Court and they accepted our case, they spun this wheel out of with all the available judges. You'll see that my judge, the one whose name was pulled out from the 27 judges on that court, all of whom were men except her. Well, maybe that's not surprising. She, she was the first black woman ever to be seated on the federal bench in our country's history. She was also the first woman judge ever to sit on the Manhattan Southern District Court. And that um, Southern District Court is the mother court of our country. So 189 years that court had not had a woman until she arrived in 1966, nominated by Lyndon Johnson. By the time my case was pulled in 1977, she was still the only woman on that court. Just want to make note that uh, Kat um, Katanji Brown Jackson said of Constance Baker Motley, who was the uh, woman who um, was my judge. You can see her here with James Meredith, uh, who she represented when she was managed to successfully desegregate Ole Miss, which Thurgood Marshall said, Connie, you'll never do it, and laughed when he gave her the case. Impossible, he said. She did it. Katanji Brown Jackson said, for all that Constance Baker Motley did as a black woman in the 50s and 60s, fighting cases of racial discrimination based on the 14th Amendment, she would have been the first black woman to sit on the Supreme Court had it been a different time. Let's just give you a little cultural overview. I think as someone said the other day at Sabre, when you've lost... Um, Peanuts, when you've lost Charlie Schultz, you've lost everyone. Um, so this is from a series that he did. He did a number of different uh, cartoons revolving around the locker room issue. Uh, the Tonight Show, you can see Betty White dressed in a towel about to get in the shower with Johnny Carson. Um, and you can see on Saturday Night Live, O.J. Simpson was the guest host with that night when in February of 1978, Lorraine Newman paired up with him as the girl reporter in the locker room and you can see that OJ had the towel around his neck and evidently to mean that he didn't have it around the rest of his body. Needless to say, these skits were filled with every imaginable corny sexual pun that you can imagine. Judge Motley ruled in my favor September 25th, 1978. And you can see some of the headlines here. Kuhn loses sex issue. So that'll give you a little flavor of basically what the coverage was like um, going into this. The locker room is open, the judge still rocking the boat, et cetera, et cetera. Judge goes with curves, meaning me, but of course the pun being baseball, strikes out the Yanks again. And then you've got syndicated columnist Pat Buchanan jumping on with his contention that once my decision came down, no one is safe in this country. What he is referring to is the ERA was also under contention at that point. And people who are old enough to remember might remember that one of the main issues that Phyllis Schlafly used against the ERA was the fact that you'd no longer have women's and men's bathrooms, that people would be invading each other's privacy. So there were certainly overtones to what I was doing. The only time the, the uh, sports writers ever used the term equal rights is when they said they wanted them. They were hedging their bets. If I won my case, they said, and it was always the same line, that they would wanted to see Chrissy Everett naked in her locker room. Women get rights and extra thrill. Men in gals clubhouse. Now it's time to go into the girls locker rooms. What again, they didn't seem to understand is that my case was not about going into the locker room. It was about having equal access to the players. In the case of tennis and golf, which were the women's sports of the day, there were no professional women's sports then. In each of those instances, the two, the people who were playing in tennis, it was the two people who had played the match. In golf, it was several of the players who finished at the top of the leaderboard. They came out into a general press area and everyone had the same opportunity 
So equal access already existed for them. So their dream of seeing Chrissy Everett naked was not related in any way to my lawsuit and my contention. I'm going to move through this a little bit quickly, uh, just to give you a sense of my mother's absolute devotion to this sport. This is from her teenage years when she would, uh, the pinpricks at the top of each photograph, she would put all of the team's players around her cornice and she would score every game that was an away game. And then she went to all the games at Fenway Park that she wasn't in school for uh, with her father. And um, she she passed that love down to me and showed me the scrapbooks that she kept with all of her scorecards and all of the uh, coverage of them. When I was born, my grandfather uh, mailed a letter. He waited three days to send it, primarily because the Yankees were in town to play the Red Sox. And while that was happening, the world stopped. And so he didn't have time to mail it until May 31st. I was born on the 27th. Uh, but in the in between, the uh, Red Sox had beaten the Yankees 3-0 in their three-game series. And so with my mother in Iowa, with her not being able to get any of the scores, anything about the game, he decided that he would tell her what happened in the game. So um, that was his, the first letter welcoming me to the world was one in which he uh, basically told me or told her about what happened. Again, my, my daughter and myself, there she is, I think four years old at Fenway Park. So now I wanna just briefly touch on the role that men are playing in this and have always played. And this is a history again that I hope to see um, in the Women's History Museum, um, Baseball Museum, when it's finally done. This is a gentleman who I met and I asked him if I could take his picture because I thought, how cool that you're wearing the city of Rockford Peaches shirt. That is very cool. Because if you look, you can't really see it here, but it says vote for women. And that is a ball player between the years 1915 and 1917 when the battle for women's suffrage was being raised. And if you see this, the suffrage ball, when women's suffrage teamed up with baseball, this is a history that it took me a while to understand and begin to do some research on. There's some great material in the Tennessee State Archives. There's some articles that are written about it. But this was a two-year period in which women who were really struggling to get the vote and trying to figure out how do they reach you know, people other than themselves? How do they connect? And they thought, well, let's go to the ballpark. You know, there's a there's an audience. We can hand out flyers. We'll put all sorts of bunting out, et cetera. And so here you see the women's suffrage with their women's suffrage baseball game. They would name it that. And you would buy tickets to it. This was the Giants and the Cubs. And the women would show up and they would hand out the flyers. They would have prizes for the ball players. But then also the uh, Women's Anti-Suffrage Association, of course, in my home state of Massachusetts, um, also distributed a booklet with the Boston Braves and the Red Sox schedules and some nutshell anti-suffrage arguments. So baseball became a locus for the suffrage movement and for that battle, um, you know, way back when. So anyway, here you see that I'm sort of dedicating this talk to my favorite uh, baseball person. She's, of course, a made up name, Katie Casey, uh, and I'll introduce you to her in a moment. But she is basically uh, she is the personification in the song Take Me Out to the Ball Game" of Trixie Ferganza. Trixie Ferganza, you see uh, women in suffrage there. She was a very big feminist in New York and definitely part of the suffrage movement. She was also having a somewhat public affair with Jack Norwood, who wrote the book, Take Me, Boat wrote the song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Jack Norwood had not been to a baseball game when he wrote it, but he knew how much Trixie loved it and how much she was involved with baseball. And so the story is that he was on a subway one day and he saw a sign saying, you know, a game at the polo grounds at such and such a time. And that evidently he took out he took out a uh, piece of paper, scrap paper that you can see in the National Archives. They have it. I've seen it. 
And he just wrote down these lyrics. And it was all based on Trixie. In fact, her picture is used on the uh, play score for the uh, first um, writing of the uh, of the song. So I'm going to end um, with a little rendition by uh, Carly Simon of Katie Casey and Take Me Out to the Ball Game because when we're at the ballpark, all we sing is Take Me Out to the Ball Game. No one who is singing it knows that it's actually a song about a girl who loved baseball. So we'll listen to, to uh, Carly sing it. Here we go, it'll come. Katie Casey was a baseball man. She had the fever and she had it bad. Just to root for the hometown crew. Every cent that Katie spent. On one Saturday, her young boy called to see if she'd like to go to see a show. But Miss Kate said no. I'll tell you what you can do. Take the bit out to the ball game. Take the bit out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I ever get back, cause it's root, root me for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. Cause it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. All right, so that's it. So let me um let me stop the share and we will come back and there you go. I know you were all singing along, weren't you? Raise your hand if you weren't. <laughs> ah, no, everybody was singing. I know that. And we were all we had these great big smiles on our faces as well. Thank uh, you I, so much. I, thank you. Can I say one thing? I'm looking in the chat. As much as you want. And Laureen, uh, who I also have a picture with from um, from there. And Laureen, I hope you saw it. I think it was in my Substack. But anyway, you mentioned that you're such a librarian. You're great at this. You said there's a really great book a couple of years ago on Constance Baker Motley by Tamiko Brown Nagin called Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality. It is a fabulous book. Tamiko Brown Nagin is a constitutional scholar she is now head of the Radcliffe Institute, uh, so affiliated with Harvard. And she's also a professor of constitutional law at Harvard Law School. She called me one day and she said, I wanna interview you for this book. And over a series of, of, of meetings that we had, I gave her a lot of materials about my case. And in that book, uh, Tomiko has one full chapter on my case. It's the only case that Constance Baker Motley heard that she devotes an entire chapter to. So if anyone is in a library or something and doesn't want to read a volume that thick and you want to read what uh, happened with, uh, you know, from Tomiko's point of view, um, that's there. And it's a wonderful book. It, I've read the book and it's fabulous. So thank you for mentioning that. She's a hidden figure in our history. She shouldn't be hidden. And one of the reasons I made the decision to write the book the way I am wrote it now, which is to really focus on it as an equal rights case in a court setting, is because I wanted Constant Baker Motley's history and the context that she brings to this period of time and the connection she makes between the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and the power of the 14th Amendment, which is something I tell to people you know, there are a bunch of characters in this book, but one of the main characters in my book is the 14th Amendment. So thank you for mentioning it, Lorraine. I really appreciate it. I did see your picture. I just haven't, and I read the newsletter. It's all, it's really good. I just haven't had a chance to, to comment on it, but I do want to put a plug in for Melissa's Substack. It's really good. <laughs> Let's build up high it's called Let's Row Together. <laughs> Let's row together. Yeah. But you just if you want to do it and look it up, you just go to Substack with Google and my name and it will come up. But thank you. I appreciate that, Lorraine. I put a lot of effort in it. Tomorrow, I have to be on the road to Maine by noon 
And I was telling Laureen, I've got to get up early and start writing one. So we'll see what it comes out like tomorrow. So we'll see. Okay. <laughs> um, folks, if you have um, questions, you can put them in the chat or you could raise your hand. Um, this was a great lead in because I wanted you to talk a little bit more about Judge Motley. And you talked a bit how it was the luck of the draw that you got her assigned to your case. Um, the case ran from April to September? Well, actually, we only had one hearing before her, one full hearing on April 14th, 1978. It did not go to trial because there was no dispute of the facts. There was an agreement and a stipulation of facts, a lengthy stipulation of facts. No one disagreed that Kuhn said he forbid me for going into locker rooms. There was a whole long list of them. And so there was no need to do a trial where we would have witnesses. So it was a hearing in which the arguments were between the two lawyers on each side and then the judge asking questions of them as they went through their, um, their own uh, arguments, um, as you'll see when it plays out you know, in my book. So, um, and then one thing you'll notice if you're far enough along in the book is that as we get to the end of what clearly had been a very frustrating and exhausting day for her, where she, this was uh, the last hearing at the end of a Friday, you know, in April, and she was clearly tired. She thought the whole case was ridiculous to be before her. She thought it was the silliest thing. She hated baseball. More than hating baseball, she hated the Yankees because her husband listened to the Yankees in the car when they would drive to Connecticut, which they were about to do that night, um, you know? And so, you know, there was nothing about this case that made sense to her. Me wanting, you know, this, I mean, why would I be in, you know, I mean, she just thought the whole thing was so silly that it was pretty clear by the end of the hearing, she makes it clear that she doesn't want to write the order in this case. She does not want to have to write a decision. So basically at the end of this very, this hearing that was somewhat contentious between her particularly and the attorney for baseball, she says, you guys go back and solve this. I'm giving you another month at least, you tell me, but you go back and figure this out. And she was exasperated. She was just like, I don't want to deal with this. You go deal with it. And of course, in the end, um, they could reach no settlement. I, I spend some time in the book talking about some of the exchange of letters that the attorneys had. Baseball still would not move off the dime. And we had to go back to Judge Motley and say, couldn't be resolved. So she, in the end, had to write the decision. And in writing that decision, um, I think, as you'll find, I went back to the her archives where she donated to the uh, put them into the uh, archives at Smith College and some of the hate mail, a lot of the hate mail that she received for making this decision, which she mm -hmm. later told my uh, lawyer, Fritz Schwartz, when they would be at legal dinners and that kind of thing, they would be often seated together. Um, you know, the elite legal firm, you know, people in New York is a relatively small crowd. So they they knew each other. And she would, she would ask Fritz questions, you know, like about the case, not technical questions because she'd made her decision but at one point she did several points she would come back and share with him you know I, I she said I just can't even understand it why would people send me this kind of hate hate for this decision she said it's worse in many ways than what I went through during the civil rights era now in the civil rights mm -hmm. era she was arguing cases in courtrooms where she could not use the phone she could not use the bathroom Whenever she had to go to the bathroom or use a telephone to communicate with people in New York, she had to walk out on the street. And whenever she walked out on the street, people, you know, protested her. They had signs up around her. They tried to, um, you know, pester her and make her break. I mean, this was really tough. She ended up in Jackson, Mississippi, where she had to be for uh, the uh, case on the uh, University of, of Mississippi. She stayed at Medgar Evers' house. And she had to have people with guns on the roof, you know, guarding that. And in fact, you know, during the time she was still in the South arguing cases, Medgar Evers was shot to death in his front yard. This was very courageous and very dangerous of her. 
to go yeah. down and argue these cases to dismantle the Jim Crow system in the South as a black woman. So I think I'll have to read that book. It's a phenomenal story. Tomiko's done a great job. Took Amy. Her yeah, took oh, her go, go ahead. Finish and then Amy. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say I'm I'm actually in the process of reading the book. Um, you're the reason that I get to go into the clubhouse and cover the Dodgers right now. So you are just, you're an inspiration <laughs> to me. Um, I'm just curious because when I'm in the clubhouse, like you said, the layout, you're not seeing a bunch of naked men everywhere. People may change, but typically it's in the shower. Throughout the court case, did they ever acknowledge that it wasn't just all these men parading around naked or did they really just stick to, oh, they you said were just the opposite. Amy, hold on. I know Amy only virtually by email. This is great to see her. And I just put a bookmark in my book for my talk tomorrow in case someone raised that question, but I need to go get it. I'll be right back. <laughs> One sec. All right, here we go. <laughs> that's Don't you love this? No, it was just the opposite. Just the opposite. So at one point toward the um end of the uh toward the end of the day and and motley is getting exasperated and the dialogue between baseball's main attorney and her had gotten so raw and so laden with just really difficult uh junctures that jesse clemenko who was the older lawyer who was the chief lawyer had finally sat down and given it to a younger lawyer named andrews and they're continuing um, to have this discussion. And at this point, the judge is saying that she's concluded in this that nakedness is not an issue. She's offered all these suggestions. Let's put curtains on the, on the cubicles. Let's have bathrobes. Let's have towels. Nakedness is not an issue. And baseball just can't accept that. They absolutely cannot accept that that's the case. And so... Um, I just might read from this very quickly um, where it says, um, Andrews says, to put these men who are star players behind a curtain and in bathrobes to go to the shower would cut down on their access, he explained. Well, there Andrews was using our word access against us. When on TV, I'd seen Muhammad Ali wear a bathrobe as the writers surrounded him to talk after a fight, it had never crossed my mind that in doing so, he had, quote, cut down on his access. Access to what, I wondered. I didn't know what he meant by access, and evidently Judge Motley didn't either. Cut down on their access to one another, she said, asking him to clarify this point. Well, when a fellow comes off the field, he takes his clothes off and casually walks around talking with his friends while he undoes his shirt. Andrews explained, his descriptive details brought the locker room scene to life in ways that Clemenko never managed to do. Quote, they talk to one another in and out of the shower room. This is the judge. Well, yes, they talk to each other, she said. In repeating what he'd said, she seemed skeptical about this, about what this had to do with what the players wore or didn't wear while they talked. Well, they visit one another at the cubicle, he told her again. They don't go behind cubicles and hide from one another. I'm getting to the main point here. Then she countered, they could if they didn't want anyone to see them naked, she countered, appearing a bit bewildered about where Andrews was leading her. This is the key sentence, Amy, to your point. Andrews, it would change baseball, the locker room, and the way teammates have related to one another for 100 years, he declared. Judge Motley seemed uncertain about what to ask next, so she called on Fritz, asking him to approach her bench. Anyway, so that's the point at which, you know, I think the point is made that you're getting at. Baseball absolutely refused to give an inch on this. She gave them every opportunity and they would not budge. They would not budge. And interestingly, in retrospect, when I read over the transcript and used it to build the story in my, in my book, I'm wondering why I didn't emphasize to my lawyer that he should have perhaps 
emphasized to the judge that I was also kept out of the locker room before the game when nudity shouldn't have been an issue. But that did not necessarily come up. It came up in some of the affidavits, but it didn't come up in the hearing. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit. But Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Steve Heath uh, is wondering if you ever crossed paths with Dave Kingman. Oh, my God. He hasn't read my book. Yes. Not oh. yet. Yes, yes. Yeah, Dave Kingman, who uh, famously, of course, packed the uh, rat in a box and sent it up to Sue Fornoff in the uh, Oakland A's um, press box uh, with her name on it attached to the tail. But anyway, that's another tale. Um, when Dave Kingman was with the Yankees, um, one day um, I was in sitting sitting in the dugout and he came out and uh, he was notorious for not wanting women anywhere around. And so he came over to me and he offered me um, some chewing tobacco. And um, he was sort of more than offering it to me. He was sort of challenging me to um, chew some tobacco with him. And so I thought, well, why not? I mean, sure, why not? So I took some tobacco. I put it in a wad, put it in my mouth. I got a cup and, you know, we just kept talking and I talked to him and I was sort of spitting it out into a cup and he was spitting it out onto the floor of the dugout and you know eventually some of the other players from the Yankees who sort of knew him and knew his act he wasn't a very popular player he was you know and they kind of knew what he was up to so some thought it was funny and others just thought it was odd that I seemed to be just sitting there chewing tobacco and nothing seemed to be happening you know, Kingman seemed to be trying to get me to do something, maybe to throw up or something in the dugout, but he wasn't succeeding. So um, finally, I just wore him down and he walked away and I took my cup and, you know, got rid of it. And that was the end of that. But he certainly challenged me. I'm glad that um, he didn't challenge me in a locker room and kind of create a scene or send me a rat. I mean, that probably would have been worse what Sue went through. But um, but yes, I had a moment with um, with Dave Kingman. I think probably every woman who covered baseball who went to a team that Dave King was on probably had a moment with Dave Kingman. Lorraine? I never thought of this one. I had a couple conversations with Melissa Ed Saber. I never thought of this question until just now. But when you were going through all of this in the 70s, what did you think the future would be like? Like by now, do you think we would have more women in sports or, I mean, could you imagine? Cause like being, you know, a girl, like I'm in my late fifties, it still blows my mind that men pay to go watch WNBA. Like I'll never get over that. And I, I'm, I just can't even believe it. So can you, like, do you believe where we are now, even though we have a long way to go, but did you ever think we would have so many women working in baseball or in sports? Well, you see, when I look back at it now, over the stretch of almost 50 years, the older me says, what took them so long? The younger me, being that person like you describe in my 20s when I was there, I couldn't have imagined the world opening up as it has for women in sports. I couldn't have imagined, you know, the number of um, young of parents bringing young boys to WNBA games and professional women's hockey league games. And uh, no, I couldn't. I mean, I, I was just, you know, I mean, let's go back to the name of the documentary, you know, see it to be it. Um, it's just very, very hard to envision a future when you don't have any roadmap or any kind of reason to think that that's going to happen now. But when you look back at it from where I am now and you think about Title IX happening during that same time, which really set in motion what we're now seeing both in the Olympics and what we're seeing in the professional women's leagues, et cetera. And you tie that in with um, lawsuits like mine, but also many other lawsuits that broke down discriminatory barriers in lots of other arenas. Um, you know, you would think that with those barriers pulled back, that we would see progress. I mean, that was the whole point of doing this was to make progress. So I think that there's a mixture in me of one side frustrated at how long it took, just like I was enormously frustrated to read the stories when 
Kim Ng was hired finally as a general manager by the Marlins. She'd been working at this 35 years. I mean, she'd been used by a number of teams, in my view, to sort of throw the diversity thing and gender up the flagpole and then have it fall down. You know, what took baseball so long to recognize that this person who had excelled at all the teams that she had been to, it took 35 years for her to rise to be a general manager. And then, of course, within two years, she's gone. You know, and we have to ask ourselves, what didn't work out? Because oftentimes when you're the first woman in something, it's tough. It wears you down. And um, she got worn down and then she got somewhat displaced. And she said, I'm not putting up with it. I'm gone. I'm out of here. And that's happened to other women too. I know at the Sabre conference for anyone who was there, I think you were Zach, I did a look at some of the women who are the early ones who came into it in different uh, positions. And if you look two years, two and a half years later, they're gone. They're gone. So, um, you know, there are still issues um, with women in what is still a very dominated, male dominated um, world. Yeah, I often would call it a fortress back in the 1970s. It feels less fortress like now, but, um, you know, it's still difficult. And if you're the only woman as a sports writer, a woman interviewed me today from the Boston Globe. And she said out of 30 people in the Boston Globe Sports Department, only four are women. And two of them work in sort of the digital media. So there are only two others. So that's two out of 28. You know, it's, yeah. it's still difficult. It's difficult when you don't have the numbers and you don't have, because it becomes a very trying task. It's a lot of weight that you're putting on that woman or those several women to kind of speak up and say when they think something is wrong or something different should be done with the coverage of a women's sport or be coverage of this or that it just becomes exhausting so um you know we the, the numbers still aren't good the numbers still aren't good and yet i go to journalism schools and talk all the time because journalism professors, particularly with Zoom, have asked me from all over the country to come and talk to their classes. You know why? Because they're seeing more and more and more women coming into sports journalism classes. And they're looking for sources. They're looking for stories that, that they can give them as a way to prepare them and give them a sense of what might be ahead and to learn from the lessons of the past. So... It's there. The pipeline is there. Can we keep them? Can we keep them? So. Do we have other questions, folks? I could keep talking, but I want to be mindful of the time and I want to be mindful for Melissa because, you know, she's on the East Coast. And I have to write my sub stack in the morning. And, right, <laughs> because I'll, I'll be looking forward to reading it. Yeah, well, anyway, yeah. Well, let me then say thank you so much to you, uh, Melissa, for joining us tonight and for all the work that you've done and all that you have been through on this journey of yours. Appreciate you uh, sharing it in the book, in the book talks. Um, you know, you were at the IWBC conference, uh, the Women in Baseball IWBC Sabre conference last year. Um, let me plug that conference again. Um, it's International Women's Baseball Center and Sabre together uh, have put on this conference and Ryan has put a link in the chat. Um, I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight. Um, Marlene, we are working Marlene, Marlene yes. let me interrupt you for a sec because Perry has corrected me. I think I spoke wrong when I talked about who wrote Take Me Out to the Ball Game. She has corrected me in saying that it's Jack Norworth. So thank you. Perry. Okay. I think I misspoke. I think I knew that, but I just didn't say it right. The other thing I want to mention before you go off is that if people are interested in getting a copy of Locker Room Talk, let me give you a secret code, a secret code. If anyone can get their pencils out, I'm going to give you a secret code. This code will give you 30% off and free shipping from my publisher. 
So if you go to Rutgers University Press, Rutgers University Press, and you go to my book, and you put in that this code I'm going to give you, R U S A 30. You will get 30% off and free shipping. There's no better deal out there. And we can avoid Amazon, which is my aim in life. Okay. Melissa's going to be in the Bay Area in October uh, for some uh, stops on her book tour. So I will make sure to share that information uh, with you all as the, the time is closer. So um, we may have a chance to see her in person and you can get your book autographed. Um, any last thoughts from anyone? I'm going to say thank you and good night. We'll see you, thank you. Um, on the third Thursday in September. As I said, it's right before the, the uh, Women in Baseball uh, virtual conference. So um, we'll see what we can put together for that. We don't have anything lined up yet. Or, well, you know, no. Zach and Steve, maybe we should... Uh, reschedule September so we don't go back to back. I don't know. And uh, Jeff Brain, you said you'll be in San Diego in October. I'm also going to be in Los Angeles in October. So if you want to come to one that is um, that I'm going to do with the LA Times and maybe the Dodgers and the Association for Women in Sports Media, you can take a look on my website. We're still trying to find where it's going to be but it's going to be on the night of October 22nd in LA. So stay tuned with my website, just my name, melissaludke.com, and then events, and you'll see all the events I'm doing. Great. Well, thank you again. Bye. Thanks to everyone from both chapters and any uh, folks from, who joined us from the um, IWBC as well. Uh, really appreciate your time, Melissa. And again, thank you for all that you have done to get us to where we are today. and where we will be tomorrow if, and where we you will can be see tomorrow. her if you see her you can be her that's right? it okay wonderful thank, thank you everybody you. have a safe night take care okay. here bye-bye night and we'll be on youtube with this video probably by tomorrow morning so wow. uh, make sure to share it with uh other folks uh, so they have an uh, opportunity to listen to this important discussion well, so any know, of these kind of key you'll be able to find it on youtube i'll put a link on my sub stack take care Okay. Good Thanks. to see you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thanks Bye. again. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye.